And one of the people in Sears' house, he said, he's a nice guy, but he took me to his house and it screamed at me. I thought, wow, that's the perfect description. Because if you don't know that this house screams at you, you don't know shit about art. Once you walk in here, you're bowled over and you're not going to be the same again. I walk around the house and it makes me say, God, that's neat. It's beautiful. You're beautiful. And I call these pieces my kids. People may have made these, these things because they needed the money or because they liked it. Who knows why they made them? The name of the game in my old age is to try and get a lot of the kids into museums where they will be appreciated. I'm still finding things that I haven't seen. I might turn around and go, oh, when did you get this? 1965, it's been on that wall. I don't know how many pieces are in the house. I'm guessing four to 5,000. It's a terrific eye. An eye not only for what's beautiful and important, but an eye for the exotic. And when they kind of come together at the same time, you've got a great piece of art. I'm always conscious of the fact that I'm a custodian, so to speak, of beauty. I mean, it's what I used to call a holy shit house. It takes me a week to get over a visit with Pete. It's hard to keep him on track because he's got all these stories. But after I die, there's no more stories because I'm dead. These chickens are around, mostly the smaller sizes, a foot and a half, two feet high, made out of scrap metal, like barrels and auto parts and stuff, and they're welded together, probably Mexican. And I just think they're hilarious. They make me laugh. So I bought this five-footer here, or four-and-a-half-foot one first, and then was able to find an eight-footer, which didn't sell for that much money because people can't fit an eight-foot chicken in their house. And then I got a pig here. And I, I buy because they're just, they're just funny. And, of course, it's sort of in the morning, I wake up in the bed looking out the window, and it's sort of like cock a doodle doo you know, the morning rooster. How many pieces do you estimate you've had over your life? Pause. 20, 30,000. I had an auction in 1990. In the auction, that auction, 18,000 pieces were auctioned. 18,000. One of my favorite painters is a guy named Chucky. And most of these paintings here are by Chucky. Chucky has been dead a long time. Chucky was from Shreveport, Louisiana. An Afro-American artist who apparently grew up, you know, in poverty. He started painting based on television and music and sports, and largely Afro-Americans. So then apparently he started selling some paintings, and then selling more paintings, and he was starting to make a lot of money. And then he died tragically in his early 40s of diabetes. One of the things that, that Chucky does is he'll paint paintings and then tell you who the person is. Arsenio Hall really looks like Arsenio Hall, but there are other paintings here that don't look like the person that I know. There's a charm about the arrangement, the lettering, and the facial expressions. This is the last of the masks that I had in the collection. All the others have been donated to the museum. This particular mask is an American piece, a folk art piece. I bought it, I liked it, I still like it, and it went with the rest of the masks. The rest of the masks are all Mexican. And there's two kinds here. When you talk about masks, you talk about a mask that, has, that was made and, and has been used in a dance ritual by Indians or indigenous people for themselves. Those masks, as they say in Spanish, have been danced, on sido bailado. The rest of the masks, something like this, are made to sell to tourists. They're 40 years old and they show the quality, high quality. The stuff you get today at the same price is garbage. The ones that look African are all Mexican masks from the Veracruz area, and those have all been danced. All right, this is a traditional form of American folk art. And the reason I bought it was because the house I bought, and, uh, the property I bought was on Fox Creek Lane. So I started buying foxes. And here is the traditional hunt. This is a, a section of Virginia which, leaving the animal cruelty fellows aside, is very steeped in the tradition of fox hunting. So this is a perfect uh, country piece for this house because I have lots of other foxes that I started to buy once I bought the property. 
I came across this piece, and it's a relief carving in a frame. It's very heavy, and it says on the bottom, El Chapo. It turns out that he is the leader of the Sinaloa drug cartel. And it's incredible because the thought behind it, these columns and his sideburns are all cocaine bricks. There's a funnel here and a spoon, which are used in, in, in taking cocaine. The museums would shy away from this because somehow uh, accepting this article as folk art would, uh, in the eyes of many, e equate uh, them as supporters of drug trafficking. But really, in 50 years, he'll just be a footnote in history, and this folk art will still be great. <laughs> I just enjoy the quiet. There's just so much noise in the world. You know, you go, go, I, I go into town and traffic lights every two blocks and people beep in their horns and music and all of this stuff. It's just a cacophony. And when you come out here and you have this peaceful quiet, it's even at night, you know, you have the sound of crickets maybe. It's just so relaxing. You just. I just walk around the property or I walk out around the house and just look out the window and derive a pleasure from that. And it's the contrast between the noise of civilization, which is just, you know, 20 miles down the pipe, and the, the utter peacefulness here. Yeah, you hear an ambulance once in a while, you hear a fire truck, but basically you're, you're sitting here listening to the Canadian geese uh, be querulous with each other, you know? And I find that a value. Uh, I find it a value. The reason I live on a big plot like this is seclusion. That you want to look out the window and see trees and stuff and not electrical wires and stuff. I never feel lonely. I think, you know, there are people who are married who feel lonely. You know, it's just, uh, I don't feel lonely. I mean, I, all of us at one time or another desire human companionship. And all of us, at some time or another, do not want a human companionship. You know, people who want, like, time out from their marriage or at least, you know, a night out with the boys or that kind of stuff. But I have a lot of friends who I love and who love me, and they come out here occasionally. It's, it's somewhat of a haul. It's ameliorated by the fact that I offer them usually pretty nice tasting food and, you know, free, free room and board. As a rule, it's an hour and a half or two hours each way. I've even picked up friends, close friends, in Washington, D.C. for lunch. Now that for me is an eight hour drive. I have many offers to stay there. I usually don't want to stay there because I enjoy sleeping in my own bed, but I occasionally have accepted offers downtown and uh, stay. You know? But so it's not like you're that far away. I mean, you're only 85 miles from Washington, D.C. and so I just like it here. Okay? And it, there's room for funk. I still am an old-fashioned kind of guy, and uh, I have you know, bills. I insist on getting the bills in person rather than having them paid online automatically. This one is bullshit. This is some, you know, advertising low rate of credit cards. Sometimes I'll take an envelope like this. Now, this is postage and fees paid for by the people who sent it to me. See that? They pay the return postage. So I get junk mail from another junk mail sender, and I fill these envelopes up as as much as they'll hold, and I mail it to them. So they have to pay the postage to get my garbage. You know? I haven't done that in a while, but I...
in, in the 60s and 70s, there was a brand of tie called Rooster, and they had the most beautiful ties graphically. So this is the latest one. It's the seasons of the year. I don't wear them at all now, I'm retired. And, and I have a collection, I, I must have 300 now. And by the way, almost all of them were printed for Rooster in Thailand, no pun intended. And I have them, uh, some of them displayed in, in the closet. Well, here's the main display of ties. And they're laid out in what I consider to be a nice order, grouping genres. Like there's horses here, fox hunting. And then you have stuff on the lawyer by training, so you have stuff on law. And then, you, and then of course, the rooster ties a brand, and they have a lot of ties with roosters on them. So they're here. And then there are other fish and dogs and other stuff. So I have to decide if this is worthy to fit in here with his brothers and sisters, despite the lack of room, or why put them in on other places in here. And I have no idea if I'll ever be able to do this because I can do a rack like this 50 feet long. And there's only a six foot one, six foot rack here in the bedroom. The thing about Rappahannock County that's attractive is that it's really hostile to development. This is one of the few counties, probably in the United States, that doesn't have a single traffic light. No parking meters, no fast foods. All of that was done intentionally. I built this house, I had it built. I wanted an old barn, I didn't get my old barn. But we built it in the shape of a barn, so that was sort of the inspiration for doing this. And the house itself is quite large. The heated space alone is 5,500 square feet, exactly. We are very quiet over here. You don't really hear any sounds. That's one of the selling points. It took me six years of whole summers to get the garden in shape. And in the end, the fight with the deer was a losing fight that they eat everything, except daffodils. The jungle is still there. The seeds are still in the ground. And they grow up and they envelop everything. There's something inherently attractive about a body of water. And this is a really big pond. And so it sort of contributes to the seclusion of the place. I was bought here thinking I would be fishing all the time, but you don't fish as much as you think you're going to fish. I even have a canoe that I bought, uh, but it's very hard to handle this canoe by myself. So if somebody comes over, we'll go out in the canoe. It's quite a beautiful sight. And in the summer, the sun sets on the side there, and it's just a beautiful reflection of, of uh, sunlight on the surface of the water. Boom, chicka boom, catch him in a rat trap. When you build a house, the most important room is the bedroom to me. But the rest of it is, what do you want to see if, if you hang out as I do in the bedroom a lot of night? What do you want to see all the time? And it becomes your favorite things. I decided that I would like to have my youth back. In the 1950s, when I was growing up, and all over America, American kids were enthralled by cowboys and Indians. And my sister's always talking about once a man, twice a child. So here in this last bedroom I'll probably ever occupy the face of the earth, I've populated the bedroom with cowboys and Indians. In painting, sculpture, uh, everything, if you like a cowboy, I mean, why stop with one? My, my, how about 20 or 30 or 40? The guy who built my house had a wife who's a trained artist, and she's well, her specialty is murals and stuff. And I didn't tell her what to paint. I wanted sky and clouds. She painted a moon. They were painted out of iridescent paint, and she didn't tell me. So at night, when you go to bed and you shut the light, the sky is filled with stars. And I asked her to paint a bunch of buzzards. And so for some strange reason, I decided that my buzzards should be talked to in Spanish. And so in the morning, when I get up and I look up, and there they are circling around, and I'm still alive, I say, todavía no, not yet, and make an obscene gesture, and then get up and get, get dressed. Then I've gotten a lot of other things that are winged creatures. For example, there's an expression, until pigs fly. So I hung that up. And you get these crazy ideas. For example, one day I saw a plastic cucumber and for some strange reason, I just said out loud, a cuke nuke. I have angels and devils from Mexico. 
the question about the collection is always anybody's collection is what what's enough and the answer is it's never enough that if you're really a nut like I am about buying if you see something you have the money for and it's available you'll buy it whether you have room or not and so I started to collect gorillas and I found one that walks like King Kong and roars battery operated I also bought seven foot high the Empire State Building and on the top of the Empire State Building is King Kong with Fay Ray in his hand and five airplanes hanging from the ceiling a lot of the collection is whimsy it's serious stuff here but it's whimsical because it tickles your fancy there's no reason why you can't have a lot of laughs about the bathroom but there's paintings in here art of people sitting on toilets there are art of of, of denture containers uh, then I have uh, a devil on black velvet sitting on a toilet and well, a lot of toilet related humor there's a uh, there are some shepherds defecating indicating the use of human excrement as fertilizer in the fields in the 18th century and I built uh, a nose that lifts up and stores stuff and a mustache so an eyebrow so it looks like a face one day I looked out the window and there was a bear uh, standing up on his hind legs looking in the window he's maybe 30 feet away and I just burst out laughing because I thought bear and then bear ass and there it was I have a collection of uh, rubber frogs the bathtub is filled with plastic lobsters and crabs and stuff uh, I have some signs that say no dumping the perfect place to put those is the bathroom for me one of the principles of decoration is massing or repetition I collect stuff that pleases me and whether it's whimsical or or valuable or not is irrelevant to me I never buy for investment if people could say well in 10 years it's going to be worth 50 percent buy it anyway there's a lot of fun and whimsical things particularly his own wood carvings which are my favorite things he has I really started this wood carving process quite by actually there was this thing in me that said start to carve wood I just went in the garage and got a piece of firewood and I started chiseling on the log. Uh, a carving of a man, lift, a, a beefy guy lifting weights, and his name was Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful is a humorous piece. Adam is a traditional folk art theme in Western cultures. And I got this idea, which I've subsequently, subsequently seen in other carvings, of getting a tree trunk and making the whole thing in one piece, except for the devil. So all of this and, the, and these people are, are all out of one piece of wood. The devil himself, he's on a pivot and he goes, goes in a circle. It took uh, something like uh, 40 hours to carve and 20 hours to paint. I think it just came out charming. And I had no experience, I just chiseled, you know? And it's still beautiful to me. I wound up asking the editor of a magazine called the Foreign Service Journal if she were interested in sculpture to put on the cover. She did of Adam and Eve in the Foreign Service Journal the issue of April of 1981. People that come over my house and look at the stuff I carved, if they don't know I carved it and I don't tell them as a rule, and when they find out it's mine, they go, God, I love that. Where'd you buy that? And then I'd say, I carved it. They go, wow, are they really, they're really impressed as am I, because I never knew how to do that stuff. I just have one piece, and it's called the Garanska font. I was very honored Pete made it just for me. I've taken it all over the world with me. It's a wonderful elephant. It, uh, has, a, uh, it has a seat on it, a howda, and it has a diplomatic license plate. But anyway, I was very pleased and very touched that Pete made it as a gift for me. When you see somebody react to it like that it makes uh, you know enjoy i don't know the word You're, my heart soars i have carved a group called say cheese the inspiration for that was american gothic there were some knots in the wood and so how do i deal with the knots i made dogs around them i did relief carving of dogs and his wife was a little short of stature to look really great with her husband and she was four inches longer but i didn't have any more wood I made her sitting down. So in the back of the carving, you'll see that she's sitting down in a chair. And there was another knot here. What the hell am I going to do with the knot? 
I put a pussycat in the knot, just because it used up the knot. And the children are all one piece, except for this guy who's sticking his tongue out. And so I used a, a dowel for that. And then the girl is sort of the tiger of all of them. She's got, they have muddy feet, and she's the devil because she has a slingshot behind, uh, hidden behind her back. And so what do you call this thing? They look like they're posing for a photograph, so they, they, it became Say Cheese. I was trying to do a play on words with Uncle Sam with his hand up in the air and a, and a famous expression by Teddy Roosevelt, which is, speak softly and carry a big stick. So I, ma I made this, speak softly and carry a big rattlesnake, Uncle Sam. I did a butcher because my father was in the meat business. It doesn't look anything like my father. I did the barbershop quartet because I found four pieces of construction lumber, which are four by fours. So I figured, well, I can round them out and do a head on that. And I just thought of it. I carved a, uh, what started, started out to be an Abraham Lincoln. Every time I hit the carving with a knife and a chisel, it looked less like Abraham Lincoln. And so I wound up not doing an Abraham Lincoln, but having a carving of a man who had a very tall thing on the top of his head. It was supposed to be the stovepipe for Lincoln. I didn't know what the hell to do with it, so I turned it into a pastry chef. Well, this is father time. At the time I carved that, which was 1980, the Folk Art Museum in New York had a, uh, a father time figure. My carving, it looks nothing like the beautiful carving that they had, but it was the inspiration. All of my pieces, they're signed it and they have two numbers. This number says 13 and four. And that means it took me 13 hours to carve that and four hours to paint it. I once, in jest, tried to sell a carving and, and I had and I put $200 on there, and the, the only guy who picked up and basically said, you've got some nerve asking $200. I said, look on the bottom, there's something like 12 and 8. I said, 12 hours to carve, 8 hours to paint. I said, I don't think $10 an hour is a lot of money for an artist. There's another way of looking at it. I do it out of curiosity, how long does it take to do it? Because people think you get a thing like this and knock it off in an hour or two. Maybe there are people who can do that, but I'm not that person. Well, you know, birds are everywhere, and so uh, in the morning I decided that I would feed birds in a bird feeder. My current bird feeder has been wrecked by a bear, but anyway, that's another issue. But so I, I enjoy the, their company at breakfast. You have your you know, eggs and or cereal and coffee, and then I feed the birds. And uh, they're probably, uh, oh, I don't know, 10 feet from me. And it's company. They're just... It's always interesting to glance up and see the variety of birds there, and they'll probably live without my bird seed, but uh, you know it's it's basically done to please people, and I'm one of the persons pleased by that. All of my house guests seem to enjoy and revel in the presence of the birds so close to us, but they're, again they're very skittish, and if I leave the screen door open, for example, they won't come. If I close the screen door, they'll come. It's fun. It's company. It's hard to find antique shops near my house, but there was one called Ginger Hill. And all of a sudden, this huge space became available. Hey, Pete. Dan, Danny, how are you? Good, how are you? And the rent was reasonable, and the commission is reasonable, so I decided to try something. And I decided to try and bring some stuff over here to sell, even though I wasn't making a lot of money. In fact, some places, some cases I've lost money. I would at least have some cash in hand and now we're on the fifth month or the sixth month. I've actually made the rent in a couple of, a couple of cases, but basically I'm selling the, to just recoup my expense and make a little bit of room in the house because in the end, I can't keep buying all the time and not sell some. Some people who come here, of course, they're interested in this kind of stuff. There are about 30-something dealers here. We all have different stuff, although there's a couple of people that have similar stuff to me. He's, spit on a, he's spit on such a... a um, yeah. he's, he's hiding his gold necklaces. I've got... Stuff. Whoa. Have you I've seen got, his tattoos, by the way? Have right. you been lucky enough? Yeah. When Pete is on the verge of buying a piece, Who did that? most often he says, I've got to own it because you'll never see another one like it. That's what you can say about pizza here. <laughs> he wants the unique. 
he is he, unique. That's how I define Pete. You you got to own the friendship because you'll you'll never you never find another one like him. <laughs> okay, that must be uh, Pete Cecilia's book, fifteen seventy five. It's easy to buy, but not easy not easy to sell. The people who have the shops, what they're selling is hope. They're selling hope to somebody who thinks they can turn around and make some money. All my life I've been impressed by the fact that you sometimes make friends for a very narrow purpose. For example, in college, I had some friends. We fished together. And after that, we didn't have any, you know, we didn't really hang around that much. A buddy of mine in the Army, uh, we met by accident because our last names both started with C and we were put in a rifle company where everything is done in alphabetical order. Uh, and I'm still uh, in maybe monthly contact and even more frequently with emails with this guy and we've known each other since 1964. I still, uh, in having moved way out uh, and trying to maintain as much contact with people that I've known for a long, long time. And this is particularly true of one aspect which is the Foreign Service. There is a major difference between normal human beings and those of us who have lived overseas for long periods of time and worked overseas. And I got a whole different perspective on everything by living overseas. Living overseas, speaking Spanish, has a lot to do with friendship. You can always make new friends and you always do make new friends. When my daughter came to live with me in Ecuador, she said to me, Daddy, what if I don't make friends? She was going to be in high school. I never went to a foreign place where I didn't think I was going to, quote, make friends because I knew I would find people that would share my views and my interests. No matter where you go, at the end of the day, you turn into yourself. So, you know, you're, you, you have a job and, and you're working for the government, et cetera. But in the end of the day, there's going to be somebody who likes the same stuff you like. It's just a great feeling. I joined the Foreign Service because I got a State Department scholarship. And I went to Chile as a student. And it just changed my whole life. Everybody that went to that, we were American. It was what they called the junior year abroad program. That was very fashionable in the 60s. Every single person that I know that was in that tour, their whole life changed radically. They all became involved in foreign affairs, telling America's story abroad. The United States Information Agency had a huge variety of things to do. Pete Cecier began his foreign service career with me in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And in Bolivia, my whole life changed. I was the director of our binational cultural center and Pete was the deputy. We were there to tell them largely about the United States. We also had a secondary function of reporting what they said. Pete is not your traditional striped pants kind of diplomat. I saw in him from that time building fascination with these cultural things that reflected the popular beliefs, the lives, the history of uh, people from that part of Bolivia. People would come to sell carved artifacts, ceramic artifacts, and particularly textile artifacts. Yeah, I liked art, so I started buying stuff. He first discovered folk art when he went to Bolivia, had his ah, eureka moment, came home with some strange devil mask or God knows what. My marriage broke up in Cochabamba. My mom said to him, holding me in my diapers, oh, you're, what are you, this, you're spending her college education money. Why are you spending your money on that painting? So I think she had more of a problem with it than I do. You could put that money aside for Eileen's college education, I said. She's seven months old, you know. I don't think it's caused him any other real problems. That was more of a conflict in his marriage. I always tell everybody, you know, if I had been assigned to the Foreign Service to the moon, I'd probably collect older rocks. I didn't have a budget, but I'd say, I'm going to buy antiques and art, but maybe no more than $200 a month, which is a lot of money. So then all of a sudden, the $200 became $400. And then the $400 became fill in the blank. He would ship things to my mom and dad in Brooklyn. That started in Bolivia with the textiles. Montevideo, Uruguay. The headbands. Mexico City. The purses. The Quito, Ecuador. Things that turned into wall hangings and rugs. Barcelona. And uh, it, it was a huge amount of stuff every time. His enthusiasm was contagious. 
Pete Cicere met an Indian carrying a harp through the streets of Quito and immediately announced to him that he had a friend who wanted to buy a harp and he should just take himself to the American Embassy and call this person and sell the harp. And I bought the harp, which is one of my treasured possessions. Uh, the only thing is that Pete neglected to tell me that the harp had spent many years in a sheep shed. So it smelled of sheep. I almost lost my housekeeper over that. But in fact, uh, she was a good sport, and if it was good for Senor Cecile, it was okay with her, and we spent a lot of time out on the lawn spraying the harp with disinfectant and uh, deodorizers and whatever, and uh, voila. And he was uh, much loved by the people that he dealt with, both in the embassy and outside of the embassy. Foreigners, I remember going to Ecuador, who's attitude toward the United States and whose idea is dependent on me. I changed those people. I was there for them. You ain't gonna read it, history book. It's not gonna be on my efficiency report. But those fuckers are never the same after they meet me. The usual rule is that women like to collect more than men. And men frequently complain about their wives' acquisitory volume. And so when I meet somebody like that, I say, tell you what, come on by the house, bring your husband, and I'll have a drink and some canapes. And of course, after that, the husband never complains because, but for the grace of God, she could be as bad as Pete Cecere and have all this stuff there. As far as female companionship in a romantic sense, I was told by a friend of mine not to take any dates into the, not in the bedroom because of, of any romantic uh, uh, stuff, but because one of the interpretations that people said was, there's no room in my life for you. I have all of this stuff and you're not in the, in the life. I said, well, I used to think of it this way, that in nature it's the male bird that makes the nest. And for me, the message should be, this is my nest, my home, would you like to come and live in it or visit it or whatever it is? One of the criteria for me was, what was their stuff like? Could I live with those things? Or could, would they live with my things? You finally decide that you just can't change. You know, you're not just gonna give it all up and go live in somebody else's house. They have their routines, their habits, which are important to me. Art is food. It's to be shared. It's something that is so, so elevating to the soul that you want to share it with somebody who's the essence of love. And food is like that. You want people to say, God, let's go to Pete's house, he's a nice guy, great art collection, and, and he was a wonderful host. That he, he fussed over us, he gave us great food, you know. The best food you ever had now, but it doesn't matter. The cooking shows are really purists. I see people screwing a dish up, and what is a cook? There's a couple of cooks that are famous for their temper. They throw it in the garbage. One guy said, well, the steak is underdone. I go, well, put it back on a burner and cook it. It's a steak, for God's sakes. It's $9 a pound or more. Uh, the other day, I made a, a black bean soup. And it was so delicious that, I mean, you, 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 you eat a mouthful and you go, God almighty. You know, I've had a couple of meals like that. It's just fabulous. And, and it got better with each day, you know, and it lasted three days, maybe. What I try to do is to cut out articles, and then I paste them in on file cards like this. And then I try to, maybe every three weeks at least, make one or two of those things. You'd be surprised how many of them are lousy. You know, you just say, right in the garbage. And there's so many recipes I have that you just say, you know, hey, the hell with it. You know, I mean, how many more ways can I make a chicken? I like to try new stuff. I know, for example, having lived in Bolivia, that one of the jungle delicacies is getting, shooting a monkey. And they get this monkey and they put him in a fire, man, like a campfire, and they cook the monkey whole. 
And then they lop his top, his head off, his cranium, with a machete, and they spoon the brains out. E you know, I mean, I don't know what I try, but, but I'll tell you, I eat calf brains. And I used to have calf brains during the Second World War when, you know, the meat was rationed. But if a calf's brain is good, what's the difference between a monkey's brain? I mean, why is one disgusting and the other? And it isn't. It's just different cultures. Here in three days, we've gone from sunny, maybe upper 40s, to near freezing now, and we've got at least a foot of snow on the ground, and it's still snowing heavily. It's very wet snow. If it freezes, then it's anybody's game. You're trapped here, and last year, last year I was trapped here for 11 days, and uh, I couldn't get out. The car wouldn't, and, and we had been plowed twice, but it was just all a sheet of ice. So every two days, I would hike out, to the mailbox and get my mail, put it in a knapsack and walk back. And it would take me, it's only, uh, it's only four tenths of a mile. And uh, that was, took at least 35, 40 minutes. And I was always afraid of falling in the ice because the road was totally iced. And uh, that if I broke a leg or something, I might die of, of, uh, of exposure at night, of, uh, uh, of hypothermia. And, Around here, your lunch, because we have bears, we have uh, bobcats, we have raccoons and other animals that uh, would be happy to feast on me if I died. This charming piece is called a whirly gig, and it was built for me in 1979 by a guy named Irvin Groff, who lives in West Virginia. Well, this, this paddle with the pecking chickens, feeding chickens, is a, is a common uh, toy and uh, with a huge European tradition. And of course, since the Europeans were the first non-natives that came to this continent, it came uh, as part of the folk art tradition. And many, many uh, countries and cultures use it. And uh, they're all more or less the same in the sense that they have a platform with pecking chickens or hens on it with uh, that, that move. And they have a, a string that goes through that operates the head with some kind of a counterweight. And it's, again, it's a kid's toy. And back here is a really large collection of, of tin cans. Most of them are from Spain. And I started to buy these, and then I wound up with about 200. I said, well, I got to stop 200. I said, no, let's go to three. Then I went to three, then I went to four. Then I went to five. And these things are generally turn of century. They're principally acquired because of the graphics. Wonderful printing on tin litho, they call it, you know, from these companies. But also the, the texts are quite funny and, and witty. Uh, I picked the ones that are most beautiful. And that's the, this group here. And they are saffron. Picture these are turn of century. I mean, like 1900. I mean, saffron is $1,000 a pound. It's an incredibly expensive spice. And these things, imagine, they would sell a whole tin of saffron. There are coffees and teas together, and then you have chickens and eggs and stuff, and you know, so you have to come up with some system. All the reproductions they make today, they don't even hold a candle to how beautiful the printing is on these things. I bought this in Spain, in Barcelona, and it's one of my favorite pieces, and I'm surprised the museums haven't taken it. It's a, it's a toy stove for a girl, to, it's a dollhouse stove. The kitchen, it actually has running water faucet. There's a little deposit for water there. And it has a lot of charm. And then these things are for cooking, you know. But I, I furnished it with miniatures over, over a long period of time, over 15, 20 years. And even here, and here's, of course, they, they burn firewood in these things. And so I even cut up a couple of branches to look like firewood. 
in here. And it's just a great, charming piece. To me, a, a museum quality piece. As, as a product of Catholic education, I found these in one store, and it's this, these religious soaps as a joke. And this one is called Wash Away Your Sins Bubble Bath. Baptism in a Bottle. Bishop Tested, Cardinal Approved. The Sanctified Soak removes stubborn guilt. Wash away your sins. Trademark. It's hilarious. And then there's other stuff here. There's a hand lotion. Similar stuff. Wash away your sins. Hand cleanser for liars, cheaters, and wrongdoers. And of course, there's a picture of a nun here saying, you know, saying, test is approved for all deadly sins. And uh, easy pump action reduces guilt at 99.4% or more. And then there's another one here. And this goes with the sister. Wash away your sins. It's a washcloth and a cleansing bar. Easy to use and the same thing. Test for, for sale for all deadly sins. Well, you know, I went to a grammar school, a Catholic grammar school, Dominicans. And, you know, in those days, the, the nuns were were a terrifying figure. They really ruled with, a, with an iron fist. All of them, most of them were nice. I mean, we didn't have any beef with them. But every once in a while, you'd find a sourpuss. And she looked like that poster. And the one that I remember was named Sister, Sister Philothea, whatever that means. And she would, when she walked in that room, I mean, we just quaked. I mean, she was such a terrifying figure. out to the remnants of a snowstorm. I'm hoping that the car will not skid so we can get out to the road, and get the newspaper and my mail, and then come back in safely. It's like saying I want to live to 100 and I'm 73. So far, so good. So, okay, now let's try here. So far, it looks good. We had it plowed yesterday. Of course, it's going to cost us about $2,000 to fix the gravel that he fucked up. I'm an old guy, and I still am uh, uh, in love with the print word and with the newspaper, the, the tactile, the tactile ability to touch a newspaper in your hands over a cup of coffee. Paperless stuff uh, uh, is not uh, emotionally satisfying to me. If uh, there's a particular point of view in domestic politics that I disagree with, I won't read about it because I know in a million years they're not going to convince me, and, and I, unless the position is something new, I won't uh, waste my time reading it. I don't really want to even get involved, say, in a serious discussion with somebody today, with all that we know about the world, that thinks that you know that uh, uh, Joe Badutz, the first caveman, walked with a dinosaur and, and you know had a pet aardvark or something. I always re re you know, like to be myself. And that self is an acquired taste, I think, with an awful lot of people. I, I am who I am, and uh, if it's a real problem that people have with me, then that's their problem. Uh, for example, language, as you know, I'm, I'm quite salty of speech, and I have had, usually, you know, when I'm trying to get a new girlfriend or something, people who uh, find it, make it a point, 
to comment about my language and the fact that they feel uncomfortable with me cursing. Of course, I usually, I have, a, of course, a standard reply to that, having developed it, a thick skin over all the years. And uh, the final point of my reply is that I'm very sorry that I offended you, and I'll try never to curse in your presence again, but I'll also try never to be in your presence again. But because I'll tell you one thing, I really don't like to stay with people who don't say all of these dirty words all the time. And if you think that I'm some aberration, then I hope you subscribe to cable television, because let me tell you, buddy, there's more bleeping out than you could possibly imagine on television. I think it's the people who don't swear who are the oddballs, you know? And I came from a home where my father never, I can only have my, remember my father saying shit once in all my life, and it wasn't like, you know, we didn't see him. And my mother, you know, would say, don't say hell, say H-E hockey two sticks. I go, Ma, if I said that, they'd beat the shit out of me. One second. Schmidt. Hello. Frank. What happened? Frank? I have to take this. I mean, hello, hello. Yes, Frank, what happened? Yes, Frank. Are you kidding? You don't have electricity? I, I, I can hear you now, yes. I said I can hear you. You're kidding. We, we, we only lost it for about 10 minutes. Hello? All right. They have no electricity. He said almost everybody in Woodville has no electricity. You know, it could be that with my medical problem, they, they made sure they put me on first, put us on first. Okay, so what were we babbling about? Oh yeah, like all curse words, if you're a translator, and I have been a translator of cuss words, Cuss words have different meanings in different countries, the same word. And they're offensive in certain countries and not offensive in others. And the power that they are, certain words, for example, in Ecuador, there's one word I would have mentioned, it doesn't matter, which is really about as dirty as you can get. And yet, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not in other countries. It's a much milder curse word. Look, look at an Italian. I once dated a woman who... Uh, was listening to one of her neighbors. And this woman uh, in her neighborhood with the windows open, nobody had air conditioning, was screaming all day long, stronzo, at her children. And uh, the word stronzo is actually a turd. It's, it's the physical stool. But it also has secondary meanings, as we do in English. When you're reprimanding a child and you call him you little shit. She said, which one of her children is called Stronzo? Because she's always yelling his name. You know? And she was just calling her kids little shits. In Spanish, that same word is mocoso, snot nose. You know, mocos are boogers. So, you know, and we have that in English too, you little snot, you know. I mean, so you, you got to be careful with the curse words because Stronzo is not a dirty word. In fact, I even had my license plate for two years in Virginia which limits it to seven letters, that said stronzo. And every once in a while, somebody would come up to me and say, do you know what that means in Italian? I said, of course I know what it means in Italian. What do you think it's on my license plate for? You know, Virginia, like other places, has a, a ban on certain things you're not allowed to put on your license plate. And they didn't list stronzo, because they have no idea what it means. We'd like to send a special welcome and thank you to our Sky Miles members. And welcome back to the second half of The Source on KSTX. I'm David Martin Davies. The San Antonio Museum of Art is opening a new exhibit this weekend, Passion Popular, Spanish and Latin American Folk Art from the Cesare the Collection. And with me in the studio, the man who collected the collection, Peter Cesare, and Sama's curator of Latin American art, Marion Ottinger. These were artifacts of a particular time in a particular place. Now we have a better idea what life was like in, in, yeah. in, in those times. You so hit it right on the head. It's all an emotional attraction to me. People ask you, how do you buy? I go, well, you walk down the street, you see it, and then you see, wow, that's the piece you buy, mm. the wow. You, you don't go out looking for other stuff because they, all of a sudden you'll find stuff that you've never seen or heard from before. And that becomes... Again, if you buy more than one, 
a collection of fill in the blank. And then one day someone said, hey, this, this collection you have, you've got something here. Marion? Well, we certainly consider it an important addition. Of course, uh, Pete has also made generous donations to the Museum of International Folk Art, to the Tucson Museum, and the Museum of American Folk Art in New York. And when I first uh, met Pete um, and got a glimpse at his collection, I knew it was material that I had never seen and that filled gaps that would never be filled had it not been for this particular collection. Uh, we are very, very uh, proud. Uh, we've worked on it for three years, putting it together. You know, it'll be the culmination of, what, 15 years, but three years of intense working on it. All right, well, we're out of time, but I, I hate to wrap this up. It's a beautiful exhibit. I, I saw it, and thank you for the walkthrough, and I would recommend it to anyone. It's just, uh, it's like going to Latin America. It reminded me so much of my trips to Latin America and enjoying that. Uh, the San Antonio Museum of Art is opening a new exhibit this weekend, Passion Popular, Spanish and Latin American Folk Art from the Cesar Collection. All of us have flown in from all different places to be here, and I think he's actually enjoying the fact that we've all come to celebrate with him. <laughs> He's probably half joking, but calling him up saying, when are you doing this exhibition? I want you to do it before I die, basically. I think it's much better to be in blue jeans and a sport shirt with two pockets on top. This is not the kind of thing that I would like to do frequently. Last time I did it was like 1992, 20 something years ago. I was at a wedding. It's a cruel form of treatment of human beings to make them wear this stuff. I mean, let's face it, who makes money on this? People who rent tuxedos. We had the uh, gala fundraiser here for the museum coinciding with the exhibit. So I came over here and we went into the, the fundraiser stuff and then a lot of people. He doesn't like being the center of attention, he doesn't like wearing a suit. There he is looking all dapper. The people who paid for the other shows were the Ford Motor Company. He had all these wonderfully elegant, very rich, probably socialite people coming up, hanging on his every word. Pete, he was a rower, he was a highway engineer. He said, buy these. He said, I'm your friend. Tell me how long you want. People really wanted to know about all these pieces, so he's telling all the little stories. It's not just stories about what they are, but for him, it's the story, that's when I was with this person and we went to that market and we stopped for lunch at that place. I really feel good walking through here and I particularly enjoy the social aspect of art which is that other people feel things or simply are thrilled to see a beautiful object. The pieces that are in this exhibition are pieces you'll see nowhere else, nowhere else. Marion has turned what used to be a compulsive shopper into a disciplined figure, <laughs> since he's very intellectual. The folk art the phenomenon up, has grown enormously. So you have a huge audience for this stuff and a growing appreciation of folk art. That the criteria should not be the education of the artist or the sophistication of the work, but the, the spirit of the painting or the sculpture, whatever it is. When I came here at first, I really didn't know how I was going to react to seeing these objects, my kids on display. I didn't know whether I would get emotional and cry, but you can walk in here and sort of like meeting old friends. Right here is a, is a wood carving of the face of Christ. The nose of the Christ is worn off by pilgrims touching his nose. These were things that I'd never seen. Extraordinary things, important things from the 19th and early 20th century. Pete's collection is very important because it preserves theoretically forever now, the artistic perspectives of a particular time and place. He just has a vision when he sees something and, and, and he can just go on and build on it. He's, everything he's always done in life, he's always done with a passion, so his passion shows through this also. You say, wow, and you, you turn and, and you want to say, look at that wood carving, whatever it is. You want to communicate that joy with another person. We chose uh, around 300 pieces, which is an enormous uh, selection for us. It's like love, you know, you say, it's no good unless you give it away. When you accept objects uh, as a gift, 
there comes a great responsibility to care and to study and to publish and to exhibit those things. So you don't accept gifts lightly. And the fact he's given away his carniceria sign, although many museums have asked for it in the past, I never ever thought he would give it away. So it does kind of worry me a little bit that, you know, he's, this is kind of like the fruition of a lot of his lifelong passion. When you see a museum take it, and you know that in 50 years, like the butcher sign, somebody's gonna come here and say, wow, what a great sign. And maybe 100 years, and maybe 200 years, and somebody will say, wow, what a great sign. So that, there's a thrill in that. I have given away several thousand pieces to museums. And I'll tell you the truth, a lot of the pieces I want to give away, the museums aren't interested in. And if I could give away, say, another 200, I would die a lot happier. And what's going to happen to the rest of the stuff? I don't think my daughter wants very much. She wants my wood carvings with her. What happens to those, I have no idea. Because after that, there's no personal meaning with the stuff. I'm also reticent to sell. I mean, if I sold the house out and it was empty, what the hell am I going to do? You know, I mean, I don't have any, anything to look at. I like to be remembered as an eccentric person who was loyal to his friends and was a good cook.